Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, a horrifying event in a family home. Five people are dead. Very happy, outgoing, uh, very family-oriented people. The search for answers includes a car in the driveway with out-of-province plates. Until there is a vaccine widely available, activity cannot fully return to normal. Canadian job gains in August come with a warning. Economic recovery could get slower from here. I'm trying to remember, like, we need to focus on the measure. On the eve of summer's last long weekend, a rise in COVID cases and pleas from health officials. And from kindergarten to university, students are returning to school. Our doctors are here to answer your questions. This is The National. A quiet suburban street in a city just east of Toronto erupted in chaos in the early hours of this morning. A shooting left five people dead, a sixth in hospital. By the time the sun rose, police had sealed off a bungalow and the investigation was underway. Outside the house, neighbours gathered on the street in shock, in pain and in disbelief. Greg Ross has the latest. I just heard... Um banging, really, really loud banging. In fact, it was gunshots that echoed through this quiet Oshawa community, waking up residents just after 1 a.m. and then there was something else. And screaming, a female screaming, I was, I didn't know what was going on, but the banging continued, continued. Residents say they heard 10 to 15 gunshots and police have confirmed they all came from inside this house. By the time police arrived, they discovered a horrifying scene. There are five victims within that residence, including the alleged suspect. So we have uh, one female, four males. Police have since confirmed that two adult males and two children were killed in the shooting. The suspect also died of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Only one person who was in the house at the time made it out alive. So there was a female that was taken from this residence uh, with a gunshot wound and she remains in hospital. Police are not confirming the identity of any of the victims who were shot, but we are learning more about the people who live in this home. And by all accounts, neighbors say they are the perfect family. It doesn't make any sense knowing Chris and Loretta that it would have been one of them. They're very happy, uh, outgoing, uh, very family-oriented people. Quiet, kept themselves, raised their kids, a really, really respectful family. So uh, I can't believe this. Neighbors tell us the parents, Loretta and Chris Trainer, are both school teachers. They have four children together, and it's believed that three of them were home at the time of the shooting. Bradley, a student at Western University. Adelaide, who is just starting high school, and their younger son, Joseph. Dominic Suick is a close family friend and a former student of Chris Trainer. He got involved with the school a lot, um, coached for many teams, for the school. Everyone knew him. Everyone knew Mr. Trainer. And Greg Ross is outside the home in Oshawa. Greg, there have been some late developments this evening. What can you tell us? That's right, Ian. Police have now identified the shooter as 48-year-old Mitchell Lapa of Winnipeg. Now, police tell us that he is a relative of the family, but this morning, he was an uninvited guest. Uh, when police arrived here early this morning, they found a white pickup truck parked outside the home here on the street. That white pickup truck had Manitoba license plates. The police towed that away to be examined by forensics, and it turns out that that pickup truck was registered to Lapa. Now, police say he was the lone attacker uh, in this shooting. His motive is unclear, uh, and police say that they're going to wait until after post-mortem examinations on the other four victims before they release their identities. Ian? Okay, Greg, thank you. At least two people have been charged with public incitement of hatred after a black man was brutally attacked in Brandon, Manitoba. He was stabbed several times in what police are calling a heinous act. I'm disgusted by it, as most people would be. Um, all people, I would hope. Um, and also by the violence involved here. Kevin Taylor was attacked by four women and a man early last evening at a popular Brandon skate park. During the assault, they hurled racial epithets. Two of the attackers are in custody while police search for the other three. Taylor's mother expressed her shock today. Brandon is, to us, it's a safe place to live, right? Oh, yeah. You know, hey, who would believe, you know, something like this would happen? 
Beverly Buckner says she's lived in Brandon for 17 years and that she has never experienced anti-black racism directed at her. Her son Kevin is expected to recover from his injuries. Let's turn now to the COVID-19 situation on this Labor Day long weekend. As Canadians bid so long to summer, health officials urge restraint and good sense. We have to keep reminding the public, whatever you do, every single person's behavior counts. Also, please don't pass around snacks, drinks, smokes, tokes, or vapes. Well, they shouldn't be sharing anything. I don't care if it's those doobies, joints, whatever you want to call them, or drinks, or right, just don't share them. That sense of caution well-founded as Canada records more than 600 cases today for the first time since June. Most in four provinces. BC saw 121, Alberta 164, Ontario 148, and in Quebec 184 new cases today. Those Quebec infection rates are the highest since early summer, and with kids back in school there, there's concern they'll climb even higher. But as Allison Northcott tells us, provincial officials insist they have the COVID situation under control. It almost looks like a normal late summer afternoon. We are allowing ourselves to go to restaurants once in a while, but uh, we're not going to go to crowded pl uh, places. But with cases of COVID-19 in Quebec creeping up, some are nervous. I'm worried that it, get, it, it gets worse, okay? And again, we have, you know, to take some drastic measures. When it was lower, I was like, okay, everything's all right. It's summertime, maybe we'll, it will uh, disappear. But now that it's going up, like, I, I'm trying to remember, like, we need to focus on the measure. For the second straight day, Quebec reported more than 180 new cases. It's the double of what we had a month ago, so we have to be careful. We're far from the eight or 900 cases, new cases a day that we had last spring, but the trend is not good. After six months, Premier Legault says he knows Quebecers are getting tired of all the health measures, but says distancing, hand washing and mask wearing are as important as ever. The health minister's message, be careful this long weekend. Pay special attention the way you meet with your neighbors, you meet with your family. Because he says more cases mean more potential outbreaks and that could affect schools, healthcare workers and seniors. Universities are resuming classes mostly online with staff preparing for their new reality. But younger Quebec students are back in the classroom, except those with medical exemptions. And in just over a week, nearly 50 schools have reported at least one case. So yes, people are going to be taking risks. This epidemiologist says possible school outbreaks are her top concern, but also worries people are getting tired of being vigilant. It's very natural to let the guard drop and once once the guard drops you we have to be concerned about what's going to happen something officials are going to watch closely as they try to avoid another lockdown allison northcott cbc news montreal in ontario nearly half the cases of covid 19 reported today came from peel region just west of toronto an upward trend that's raising concern ahead of the long weekend and the start of the school year Ali Chasson has that part of the story. Today marks the highest single day jump of COVID-19 infections that Peel Region has seen since June 4th, with 72 cases. That's concerning, especially with the fall coming. People are going to have to smarten up. The timing isn't great, right? We're just days away from school, school. starting. Who are you worried about? I'm worried about my young siblings and my, bro my, my son. I'm worried about them. Just this week, two Peel District School Board education workers tested positive for COVID-19. One, a teacher, another, an administrative worker, but neither were inside a school during the time they were infectious, and there's no risk to the school community. Like most of the province, Peel's case counts have been falling into the low teens over the last month, so why are they creeping up now? Most of the cases, uh, thankfully, have been linked to uh, a number of workplace outbreaks and then household clusters associated with those same workplaces. We are also a month into stage three of reopening, where we can have larger gatherings, dine indoors. By being in stage three, we really do need to make sure uh, that you know, businesses are taking precautions and ensuring that their employees and customers are being kept safe. Uh, and certainly that residents, as they're out and about in their household and social interactions, are also taking precautions. Peel Region's Medical Officer of Health says this uptick means people may be getting a little lax. 
And the situation has caught the Premier's attention. I'm really concerned about what is happening in, in Brampton. We won't hesitate to, again, shut, shut it down because, again, we're, we're, we're seeing a slow creep. Seeing this spike in cases means these mobile testing centres aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And timing is going to be critical in curbing this. We are headed into a long weekend after all. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Brampton. The COVID alert app is meant to warn people that they've come close to someone who has tested positive. Dr. Theresa Tam wants to see more Canadians use it, but as Thomas Dagla explains, they can't until more provinces come online. As the warm summer days wind down, there will be less of this, more crowding indoors and a greater need for a tool like this one. I've had it for a while now. It's actually really reassuring. It gives me an alert every week that I haven't had any exposures. The COVID alert app creates a random code so that no one will know your name or your location. With an ad blitz, the federal government has convinced more than 2.2 million Canadians to download COVID alert. That's a small minority of smartphone owners. We can definitely do better, and I've been encouraging more people to download. The technology is meant to warn users who may have been exposed to the coronavirus. So far, only Ontario and Newfoundland and Labrador have adopted the app. Saskatchewan vows it's coming soon, while Quebec has said it won't join in. And we don't know what's going to happen when school starts and when cold and flu season is happening. So I think that's when the app might actually have most benefit. But with so few users, can the app still help? Well, new Oxford University research suggests virtually any level of local uptake can lead to fewer infections. It's extremely unlikely that it doesn't have a positive impact. The question is how much of a positive impact is it going to have? And um, how much is it going to help us return to normal life? This week in Ottawa came proof the app works when a user tested positive after first being warned by the app. This man's wife in Toronto got an alert late one night too. You just said that you've been, you've been in the vicinity of someone who tested positive for 15 minutes and that uh, you should go to uh, get tested as soon as possible. They tested negative, but better safe than sorry. That's really what the app's all about. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, Toronto. COVID-19 is not only a health catastrophe, but also an economic one. And new figures today suggest the pace of recovery from that historic blow is fading fast. In a matter of weeks, 3 million Canadians lost their jobs, but the bounce back in June was rapid and encouraging. It has slowed since. Last month, just 246,000 jobs returned. Employment still more than a million short of pre-pandemic levels. Unemployment still above 10%. And Jacqueline Hansen shows us some gains made so far could be fragile. In good times, just under 500. It's still far from normal for Paul Bogner and the 60 restaurants his company runs. From Jack Astor's to the Loose Moose and this Duke's in downtown Toronto. Its reopening was possible only because of this makeshift patio. This has given us a chance to survive. The food services sector has clawed itself back from some of the worst job losses. But as of August, employment is just 80% of what it used to be. And some jobs are never coming back. Next door to Duke's, this pub closed permanently. Overall, Canada has gained back nearly 2 million jobs. That's still more than a million short of what was lost. And that last million is likely to be the toughest. As the opening slows, we would expect hiring to slow with it. This economist says any further recovery will be held back by physical distancing and limits on gatherings. Um, so those still sitting on the sidelines, um, it actually unfortunately might take a little longer to be called back simply because we do need to have some form of social distancing in place until a vaccine is widely available. And this precious patio space won't last. Come fall and winter, it won't be an option. That's our biggest fear. I hate to say it, but this is our lifeblood. Without patios or additional government help, Bogner says he may have to lay off as much as 40% of his staff. Well, those 4,500 employees are like family. To realize that you couldn't bring them all back to begin with and now potentially have to lay some more off, it's going to be devastating both you know, from the impact of the business, but, but also emotionally as leaders. That potential second wave of job losses 
could slow Canada's recovery even further. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Today, the World Health Organization said it doesn't expect mass vaccinations against COVID-19 until the middle of next year. No vaccine is going to be mass deployed before the regulators are confident and the, and the governments are confident and that WHO is confident that these vaccines have met the minimum standards of efficacy and safety. And so far, none of the vaccines has demonstrated a clear sign of reaching that WHO standard. And today, Russian scientists finally released the first results from early trials into their experimental vaccine. The report, published in the medical journal The Lancet, says the Sputnik V produced an antibody response in all participants and led to no serious side effects. Despite the trials being very small, the shot received Russian government approval last month and more robust tests are already underway. One month ago today, an explosion killed 199 people in Beirut. Against all odds, rescuers think there may be a survivor in the rubble. While that search has been called off for a second night, Rene Filipponi tells us it's giving hope to a shattered country. A faint heartbeat detected in the rubble had crews searching for a second day, fueled by the chance someone may have survived. A rescue team from Chile is aiding the effort, moving rubble by hand, using sensors and sniffer dogs. Maybe there's nothing, but as long as the trained dog is giving us, is marking a human body, and the machine is giving us a heartbeat, as long as we're gonna keep searching. That's, that's how it works. As night fell on Beirut, the crew wouldn't confirm if they could still hear the heartbeat, just that they wouldn't give up. For the crowds watching with anticipation all day, there was also anger that after the blast, not enough was done to search. Adding to that outrage is news more explosive ammonium nitrate was found at the port. I don't know how to explain how we ended up in this situation. The government has been completely complacent. To mark a month since the explosion, there was a ceremony near the port and a moment of silence to remember the nearly 200 people who died. From his roof, the damage is everywhere Shadi Risk looks. The blast devastated his home and left scars all over his body that are a constant reminder of the moment he thought he was going to die. I called home and uh, my sister answered. So I was like, I'm dying. Please send my regards to everyone. And uh, please stay with me on the phone. His physical wounds are still healing and Risk had the stitches removed this week. His doctor says those injured in the explosion will never fully heal. There are no scars that will completely disappear of the soul or of the flesh. But even the chance of a survivor is enough to elicit the slightest sense of hope, something the people here are clinging to amid unbelievable devastation. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Joe Biden is slamming Donald Trump tonight over reports Trump called fallen U.S. soldiers losers. Who the heck does he think he is? Next on The National, why Trump's opponents aren't buying his denial. Whether it's back to school or off to college, you have questions for the doctors. What are the risks of living with roommates? What happens if I get a cold? And remember these guys? I'm Liam. I'm Lucas. Bon voyage. While well, their pandemic project has landed them a new gig, we're back in two. For many U.S. voters, being Republican means supporting Donald Trump and supporting the troops. But a report has quoted Donald Trump calling fallen soldiers losers and suckers. And as Stephen D'Souza explains, that has the Trump campaign on the defensive. At the time, it seemed odd the President of the United States skipping a ceremony to honor Americans killed in the First World War, blaming the weather, even though other officials made it. The Atlantic Magazine reports that on that specific visit, Donald Trump told staff, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. Later, he called 1,800 Americans who died in the legendary Battle of Belle Wood suckers for getting killed. The reporter behind the story stands by it and his high-level, unnamed sources. 
he doesn't understand why one would go pay that level of respect to fallen American soldiers. Trump called it fake news, Thank blaming you. the story on disgruntled former employees. They had a rainstorm, the likes of which you've rarely seen. The fog was so great, it was, it was as dense as I've ever seen. And I said, nope, I want to go. I insist on going. Trump also denied calling former prisoner of war and Senator John McCain a loser, despite an established record of saying exactly that. He lost. So I never liked him as much after that, because I don't like losers. He's not a war hero. My stepson was not a sucker. Veterans groups are already looking to capitalize on the story, which has been confirmed by other outlets, including Fox News. For some veterans, the story speaks volumes about Trump's patriotism. To me, his patriotism is a, it's a show. It's no different than anything that he's been doing you know, over the last couple of decades on, on television. Trump has survived storms like this before, but a new poll earlier this week found for the first time in four years, more troops support Joe Biden over Trump. Good afternoon, folks. Biden, meanwhile, Sorry. whose late son Bo served in Iraq, tried to contain his rage. I'm always cautioned not to lose my temper. This may be as close as I've come. Biden said Trump has no sense of loyalty to anyone but himself, an attack that could resonate in a divided country where the military is often a unifying force. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. And back in this country, an Ontario court has struck down Premier Doug Ford's mandatory anti-carbon tax gas pump stickers. Well, we'll have to review the decision. We obviously respect the, uh, the judge and the, and the court's decision. The judge ruled it unconstitutional to make partisan arguments through private retailers. Gas stations now have the option to keep or remove the stickers as they see fit. Ontario brought in the measure after Ottawa imposed a carbon tax levy in the province last year. Hyundai is telling owners of more than 200,000 recalled vehicles to park them outdoors until repairs are made. That's due to the risk of engine fires. The cars are part of an initial recall announced yesterday by Hyundai and its affiliated Kia Motors of more than half a million cars in both the United States and Canada. And Transport Canada says it's fined two airline passengers for the first time because they refuse to wear face masks on board WestJet flights. They'll each have to pay $1,000. The first incident happened in June, the second in July. Masks or face coverings have been mandatory on flights since April the 20th. Next, we put your back-to-school questions to the doctors. What happens if I get a cold? Will I have to stay home for two weeks? The experts answer that and much more after the break. OG with a look! Got it! And the buzzer beater Raptors fans are still talking about tonight. This September, heading back to class is complicated. Some students are already navigating early days in the classroom. Others are gearing up to start. While a return to school looks different across the country, the common theme is anxiety. From masks to mental health, staggered starts and social distancing, parents, students, teachers have all been flooding our inbox with questions. So tonight we're joined by infectious disease specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh and Dr. Nikolai White, a family doctor in Toronto. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having me on. Dr. Bogosh, let's start with uh, this question from Mark, a, a grandparent from here in BC. How does a move to cohorts align with previous public health guidelines regarding social distancing and keeping social bubbles small? And just before you answer that question, I'll just jump in and say cohort has become kind of a, a COVID jargon word. And, and for example, in BC, it's 60 students in younger grades, up to 100 student, 120 students in older grades that they kind of stay not in one classroom, but, but in, in one group. Uh, Dr. Bogosh? Yeah, so that, that, that could potentially be a, a problem. And certainly, if there is a case of COVID-19 introduced into a class, it doesn't necessarily mean that the entire class or the entire cohort needs to go home and self-isolate for 14 days. What will happen is the public health unit will investigate. They'll determine the specific circumstances around that positive case. 
It certainly is going to be the case that the affected individual will have to go home for 14 days. It might be the case that the whole class has to go home. It might be the case that there's just a few other people within the class that have to go home. But a lot of that will depend on the investigation conducted by the local public health unit. All right, Dr. White, next question to you. you your clinic is near the University of Toronto campus, so you've probably fielded questions like this one. What are the risks of living with roommates during the pandemic, specifically in a university setting? Thanks. I think the first thing is to remember that you're going to be in close contact with your roommates. And so it is important to be in communication with them. You should talk about what you guys are going to do if someone becomes sick. You should remember that if anyone is symptomatic, you should go get tested. Right now in Canada, we do have access to testing. So do not hesitate to go if you're having fever, cough, or if you're just generally feeling unwell. It is important that if someone is sick at home that you physically distance from them, try to stay in different rooms, don't eat meals together. And if possible, you could even consider wearing a mask at home. I think the main thing is just having that conversation and making sure that everyone in the household is on the same page. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of vigilance by people in, in settings they don't really expect to, to act that way, like, like in their apartments or with roommates. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, with the cold and flu season around the corner, we're getting a lot of questions like this one. Hi, I'm Olivia, and I'm going into seventh grade this year. I was wondering what happens if I get a cold. Will I have to stay home for two weeks? All right, Olivia, that's a fantastic question. It's not necessarily the case. Uh, the different provinces have different protocols for what to do in a situation just like that. If clearly there's been a, a close contact or a potential contact with a person who's positive for COVID-19, yeah, you probably will have to spend 14 days at home or go and get a diagnostic test and how that helped determine the duration of time at home. But if there's no obvious close contact with someone with COVID-19, and if you speak with your primary care provider or online or, or with the local public health unit and they say there's no need to get a test, uh, then in some situations, depending on the province, they'll say you need 24 hours without symptoms and then you'll be allowed to return to school. Dr. White, all of this is complex, but this next question, you know, is particularly both timely and complex. A lot of families dealing with lots of stresses and COVID is just one part of that. Our children are very aware of what's happening south of the border. They're also faced with issues here in Canada and have to deal with um, the stress of racial injustice. Now, in addition to that, we they have to go back to school my question is how do we best help our children who are going through uh now two different uh types of stress and anxiety it's a very uh challenging question and i really feel for that family um it's been a difficult time for everyone and right now with all of the social injustices that are coming to light not just in the United States, but also even in Canada, it's even harder for people of color. And I think one of the most important things is to talk to your children about what's going on and to educate them, to explain some of the history of why some of these things are happening. Um, many kids don't have access to, to good sources of information, so make sure that you are providing that information and they're not hearing it from someone else. Um, personally, I've found it very stressful dealing with, with not just COVID, but um, seeing some of the, the social injustices that have been happening over the past few months. I think it's important to remember that stress can impact our immune system. And so you should think about ways to help your immune functioning and things like uh, physical activity and exercise, making sure the kids are staying active, make sure they're eating well, make sure they're sleeping well. Really, this is a time to engage in their education. So reading, uh, thinking about getting them engaged in other types of hobbies, arts and crafts, et cetera. You know, there is hopefully some positive that will come out of all of this. And the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that we're shedding light on these issues, hopefully that will lead to some meaningful change. And hopefully in the future, we won't be having to have these difficult conversations with our children. But. Um, I'm, ho I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and you really should convey that to, to the children that although this is tough, we hope that it will get better.
Nice to hear some optimism, but also a you know, very thoughtful answer. All right, Dr. Bogosh, this next question uh, for you. Uh, teachers have a lot of concerns about exposure to COVID, and full disclosure, my older son is a teacher. But here's a question from a teacher named Teresa Wong that she uh, sent in to us. Should I be bringing a change of clothing to school? Should I wear a covering such as scrubs, apron, etc., to cover my clothing? I personally don't think that that's necessary. And our, certainly our understanding of how this infection is transmitted has evolved over the last few months. And, you know, earlier on in the pandemic, we were very concerned about what we call fomite transmission, meaning can you pick this up from an inanimate object and get infected from those inanimate objects? Certainly that is possible. It's just much, uh, much smaller a risk than we previously thought. So I don't personally think it's necessary to wear scrubs to, to a, a place like school or to bring a change of clothing to, to, uh, to school. I think uh, hand sanitation is extremely important and of course attention to the other fundamental public health principles like physical distancing and putting on a mask in an indoor setting. Dr. White, I don't know if you've been getting a, a version of this question in your practice, but uh, via email we had somebody asking about the best face covering for kids when children return to school. Why can't they wear face shields rather than masks? Well, I think it just comes down to the purpose of having a face covering. The goal is to prevent droplet spread. And so I, I don't necessarily think we, we have any studies comparing uh, face shields to masks in children. I think the main thing, though, is that something should be covering their face. Uh, I do think from a practical standpoint, in terms of availability, uh, masks are easier. They're, they're more readily available right now in Canada. They're relatively easy to make. I think getting every child in a face shield would be a logistical challenge. And so I think probably the best thing would be some sort of face covering, a cloth or a mask covering would be adequate. I don't necessarily think we need to have our children wearing face shields. And you know what, we have 30 seconds. So Dr. Bogosh, let me put the same question to you. Yeah, I completely agree. Certainly, they just haven't been compared head to head. And most of the data that we have, which is far from perfect, is really for featuring on masks. I think the vast majority of kids can wear a mask and that'll, that'll do just fine. In the rare, but real, but still rare circumstance that a child cannot wear a mask for whatever reason, a face shield should certainly be uh, a fine alternative. And, and uh, as Dr. White points out, the key thing here is covering the mouth and nose. So preferably a mask, but a face shield for the rare circumstances that a child can't wear a mask would be a fine substitute. Dr. Bogosh, Dr. White, really nice uh, hearing from both of you tonight. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we are always looking for questions from you on uh, the COVID-19 issue. You can keep sending them into us. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send us an email at COVID at CBC.ca. Time for a quick break. When we come back, an Alberta community divided by wind turbines. What residents want you to know about green energy. We hear a lot about the shift to green energy these days, especially when it comes to the post-COVID economy. But in reality, the transition can bring its own set of complications on the ground. Erin Collins visited one Alberta community where wind turbines are changing the landscape and dividing the residents. Locals call it the island, a sliver of Alberta prairie wedged between a river valley and a coulee. A handful of families have called the island home for more than a century carving out a life on this land, farming and ranching together for generations. But a new chapter is opening on their story, one that's changing the landscape and the community here. A wind farm has been built just to the south near the village of Halkirk. Another is approved much closer to home. Chris Bloomhagen was combining on his organic farm when Capital Power called to sell him on putting a wind turbine on his land. Well, Chris says they pushed hard, telling him his neighbours were already on board. So he signed for $10 and a promise of thousands more once the turbine started spinning. He later learned many of his neighbours hadn't signed. They lied to me. They essentially tricked me. And is it my own fault because I didn't call my neighbours? Yes. But... I would expect if someone as big a corporation as this would send someone out, I would be treated honestly and fairly. 
Every year, everybody here fights to reduce their carbon footprint. Well, that got people here talking, and as they always have, neighbors leaned on one another when times got tough. They even formed a bubble during this pandemic, scrambling to find out who had agreed to the project and who hadn't. Well, it turns out less than half of residents had signed, and even in a community this close, who signed and who didn't created divisions. Gerard Fitas didn't sign, his brother did. It's really divided the community, hasn't it? It's divided families. You've got experience with that, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, got a younger brother that, you know, he's in, in favor of how uh, is the project, how they want to do it. And, uh, you know, and I can understand his part because he only has one quarter of land and he'd really like to have a wind turbine on it. And, but it's the effect that it has on the other people that are living around him. So... You know, you can kind of see his side of things too, but uh, yeah, it's, and we, you know, we got to get the people talking to each other and get the developer talking and, and try to figure things out. Well, Gerard's family's been here in the area since 1904. His father taught him how to fly here when he was young. And for a time, he made money crop dusting. Well, now he flies just for the love of it. That's why he built a runway on his land. From the air, he can see his brother's home where Capital Power plans to place a wind turbine and just 650 meters from his landing strip. That despite recommendations from Transport Canada that turbines should be no closer than four kilometers from a runway. If it's not safe and somebody runs into a turbine or gets caught in the turbulence or something and then you have an accident, hit somebody's house. So it's not only affecting the pilot, it's affecting all the residents that live in the area. Capital Power didn't agree to speak with us, but in a letter, the company denies any allegations of unethical behavior, saying they act with integrity, work to address stakeholder concerns, and abide by all laws and regulations governing the project development process. But the feeling here is that the rush to embrace sustainable energy has meant that their concerns have been passed over. Not so according to the regulator who approved the project. The Alberta Utilities Commission says every effort's been made to accommodate those concerns, including putting 24 conditions on the project's approval. Those are in place directly to answer some of the concerns that the interveners had about the project and they range from airport considerations to wildlife uh, and noise. Well that's not how people on the island see it. They see a push to meet the green energy needs of urban Canada on the backs of rural communities like theirs. And there has to be a mutual respect. There has to be an appreciation for what's already there and there has to be a goal for what we can maintain and sustain for the future. Katrina Smith grew up here. Her home just down the road from her parents and brothers is off-grid. She supports a shift to greener energy, but she worries that a wind farm will change this land and the community she wants to raise her children in. Um, as you can see, we run on solar. We're 100% supportive of renewable energy in all capacities, but it's, it needs to be done with consideration and it needs to be done with diplomacy and it needs to be done in consideration of those that are here to live. And those people have questions. What will happen to the turbines when they're finished turning? How will a wind farm impact their health and their livelihoods? This legal expert says those questions need to be addressed and the worry is that if they aren't, Canada's shift towards green energy could stall. The more the, the energy producers can work with people to make sure their issues about the siting of the turbine are taken into account and they're actually deriving some benefit from the project, the more acceptance, the more enthusiasm, the more people are going to get behind the transition. This island understands that transition better than most. It's hosted the dawn of coal and oil booms over the years. For now, the wind farm planned for this area is in limbo. A sluggish economy means construction has yet to begin. Capital Power has until the end of 2022 to complete it. 
But people here worry that if they do build it, this change will be different, more permanent, marking the twilight of a way of life on this land. Aaron Collins, CBC News, near Halkirk, Alberta. Next on The National, breaking down one of the great moments in Canadian sport. OG with a look, got it! We'll hear from the Raptors on this series-saving buzzer beater right after the break. Kawhi up top, looks at the clock, turns the corner for the win! Some of you have watched that moment a lot. The night Canadians held their collective breath for what felt like an eternity, waiting for that basketball to drop. A lot of us thought we'd never see anything close to that with the Raptors again. Then came last night. A pivotal Game 3 for the Raptors in their series against the Boston Celtics. Toronto already down two games, and no NBA team has ever come back three-zip in the playoffs. Devin Haru takes us through it. Walker dishes, ties, the Celtics had started their party. Surely the game was over with just a half a second left. Point five to go in game three. OG with a look, got it! Unless the Raptors could find one improbable act of magic. Lowry. An extraordinary pass from Kyle Lowry who stands six feet tall, arching the ball over the outstretched arms of Taco Fall who is seven foot five across the court not just near awaiting OG Ananobi remember he had to shoot in less than half a second but to a perfect spot then OG delivered and he knew it this is my shot I expected to make it so like, I don't shoot trying to miss like, every shot I shoot I try to make it so I was not surprised I wasn't surprised his reaction nonchalant his teammates not so much I guess, man, that has to be one of the, the most classic reactions of all times, man. Yeah, no I, I just saw it for the first time about 10 minutes ago, and I'm, I'm just like, it brings a smile to your face. Last year, the Raptors went down two games to none to the Milwaukee Bucks, but they found a way to steal game three and went all the way to the championship. Is history repeating? Well, I think uh, last night's the season was on the line. It's a big one, big win, and um, obviously we, 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 we just worry about one game. One big game for the champs, one huge half-second shot. Now part of Raptors lore. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Do you get the sense Devin loves his job? Well, he does for sure. Next on The National, a couple of brothers get their big break. Their weekly newscast is getting a little bigger. It's our moment, next. Hi there, my name is Liam Sakalaskis and welcome to ECK News. You might remember these Nova Scotia brothers from back in March using their cancel classes to create their own newscast and now maybe even new careers. The brothers got a big break. Their online weekly newscast was picked up to become a television show for their community. And that's our moment. It used to be we are in, down in our basement and we are just reading from a script. Hi, I'm Liam and welcome back to ACK News. But now Bell Media wanted us to go around Cape Breton and show off the island. We're going to be looking at making eight episodes, and each episode is eight minutes. We're going to start filming at the end of September. It's exciting because a long time ago, we were just these kids on YouTube that had like a couple subscribers. And people that we don't even know write comments saying, you guys just made my day, and it makes me feel really happy. They got to go on the CBC News and a couple other of the news production places. And uh, yeah, so somebody saw it on the National one night and, and reached out and said, oh, you should pitch that to Bell. I think they might enjoy it, something like that on their uh, on-demand segment. So that's what we did, and here we are. 
They saw it on the National and pitched it to Bell. I guess that's fine. We're all one big happy family. And, uh, you know, they have a certain presence. And though it is, I guess, a community channel, you never know what will come from a community channel. I think Tom Green, way back when in Ottawa, is where, you know, that's kind of where he first became familiar with television. So we'll see how far it goes for these guys. That is The National for September the 4th. I will see you on Sunday. Good night.